Welcome to 10 Minute KQL. These short 10 minute sessions will teach you KQL, allow you to get hands on practice in a lab environment, and provide some homework to practice after the session. This is the seventh video in the KQL Intermediate series. In the last session, we focused on external data. In this session, we'll introduce rounding, argmax, and union. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell. If you've been following along in the training series, we've covered a lot of ground so far. In today's session, we want to start off by describing how to round numbers, how to use argmax, and union. After that, we'll begin a multi-part series on joining data sets, then finish the intermediate series with a debugging challenge and end of series quiz sessions to test your knowledge. When we have a decimal or real data type, sometimes the numbers after the decimal may continue on many places. If we don't have a need for that level of detail, we can round the numbers to any level of resolution we want. To do this, we can use the round function. Today we'll be using a free Azure Data Explorer or ADX environment. For directions on how to access this free ADX environment, refer to session two of the KQL Beginner Series. In this example, we're taking a sample from the help cluster, sample IoT database, and the transform sensor data table. This table provides values of IoT sensors paired with timestamps. As we look at the value field, we can see the sensor data ends with many decimal places. If we examine the schema, we can see the value field has a real data type. If we want to round the information to only two places after the decimal point, we can use the round function. If we need to, we can still rename the field in this way. In previous sessions, we used min and max with summarize to find the minimum and maximum values of a given field. We can also use the argmax function. Argmax will return the entire record or a portion of the record that we specify for the maximum value in a specific field. In this practical exercise, we'll first start off with max and we'll find the max value for each sensor. When we run this query, we can see the results provide the maximum sensor value for each sensor. It may be that sensor 9 had 100 values, and we've just identified the highest one in the given time span. Now let's change to argmax. When we do this, argmax wants the first condition to be the field we want the max value of, in the same way as the last max exercise. Additional conditions represent which fields should be displayed in addition to the value and sensor name fields. We can use the asterisk, which is sometimes referred to as a splat or wildcard, to display all fields. Now instead of only seeing two fields, we see all fields for the individual record that had the highest value. Again, there may have been 100 different records for any of the sensors, and we're just seeing the complete record to include the timestamp of the one with the highest value. The use of argmax in this way can add how we conceptualize the use of summarize by adding additional enrichments. When we use the asterisk, it displayed all five fields. What if we only wanted to see the sensor name, value, and timestamp fields? Our summarize line will already display the sensor name and value fields. So we just want to add the timestamp field. Instead of the asterisk, let's type in timestamp. We can see that when we use argmax, it's almost like a project statement, and that we can just keep adding additional fields we want to see to further enrich the summarized data of the record with the maximum value. We could also use project reorder if we wanted to clean up the final output. Keep in mind, when working with timestamps, the max value is the latest or most recent timestamp, and the min value is the earliest or latest timestamp. In this example, we're taking a sample from the sales table. To organize the data, let's first sort by first name, then last name. We can see all the purchases by Aaron Adams. What if we want to see the record that shows the highest total cost for Aaron? We can first filter down to Aaron Adams, then summarize using argmax. Now if we want to see the complete records for each combination of first and last names, we can just take out the first two filters. 
To add some order to the output, we can sort by first and last names. Using this query, we should be mindful that it's possible to have two or more people with the same first and last name. So it's better to use a unique customer ID. In the lesson so far, we've been working with one data set at a time. Sometimes our data sets are organized where we can have many fields in different tables that can be joined together to help solve problems. For the rest of this session, and in the future sessions in the intermediate series, we'll talk about the many ways to combine two or more data sets together to answer questions and solve problems. In previous lessons, we described the difference between contains, has, and double equals. One option may be more precise, and one option may be more flexible. Each option may have its own use case. Contains may use more resources than has, which uses more resources than a double equals. When selecting the right option between contains, has, and double equals, we compare precision, to processing power, and include the use case. Using a similar formula, we can decide how to combine data sets and which is more efficient, which is more precise, depending on the use case. The first option we want to show is how to combine two data sets with union. A union between two data sets places all the records from each data set together in one unified data set. We don't need a key to join the two data sets together since all the fields will simply merge into one data set. As you can imagine, this uses a lot of processing power since there's no real filtering happening if we use union alone. In this example, let's start out by taking a sample of the sales table. We can see it has about 15 fields and contains purchasing information on customers. Next, let's take a sample of the customers table. We can see it contains roughly 12 fields that contain information on each customer. What would happen if we simply merged both tables together with union? We can do this in a couple different ways. First, let's set two variables, and the first will represent the customer's table, and the second will represent the sales table. On the next line, let's use union, followed by our two variables. If we ran the query right now, there'd be an incredible amount of data and processing power being used, and the query may time out or fail. So let's take a sample of 100 records. We've now combined the two data sets. Right away, we can see that some fields have information and some do not. We can also see the total number of fields grew, so that we have fields of both tables. Let's sort these tables by first name, last name, and city name. The first and last name fields are from one table, and the city name is from a second table. When we run this query, we see Aaron Adams and all of his sales from the sales table. As we scroll down, we see one record at the end before it moves on to the next person. When we scroll to the right, we see fields from the second table. We notice that there's one field that seems to be in both tables, which is a customer key. This key ties both fields together. We also see a product key, and we may want to use that key later to join additional tables. Let's summarize a count by first name, last name, customer key, and city name. So we have fields from both tables represented. When we run this query, we can see we have fields from the sales table, along with fields from the customer table. While it's possible to union more than two data sets, you should be careful to narrow down the results to just the information you need because it can be very resource intensive, depending on the size of your data set. Since union combines all fields together, which takes more resources, it may not make sense to only display four fields. In this case, we could have narrowed down the fields before the union, or we could have used a join. We'll learn more about joins in our next session. There may be scenarios where you have multiple tenants and you're gathering information from the same table name, but from different workspaces. This is a great use case for union. As we'll see in future sessions, the join is more precise, consumes fewer resources when optimized, and there's a common key to link the data together with. For homework today, use the free ADX environment. 
If you need directions on how to access this free environment, refer to session two of the beginner series. Working in the help cluster and Contoso sales database, write a query that unions the sales fact and customer tables together. Show results that display the first name, last name, customer key, and state or province name. Take a sample of 100 records so the query doesn't time out. Post your query in the comments section of the video to learn with and help others. That's all for today's session on rounding, argmax, and unions. In the next session, we'll begin part one of joins. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell.